these clean Bible studies to grow in our knowledge of the Word of God with a focus on knowing God more intimately through His Word. He calls us to cling to Him, Deuteronomy 13, 4, and we can't cling apart from His Word. His Word reveals His will, His ways, His heart, His plans and purposes, His sovereignty. His Word reveals who He is. We want to know Him. 1 Corinthians 10, 11, after revealing some of the events of the Old Testament during the time of Moses, says this. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So we can study books like 1st and 2nd Samuel as we've done on this channel. And we can look at the lives of people like David, King Saul, Hannah, Jonathan, and we can see what it looks like to cling to God and what it looks like not to cling to God and how God responds. We learn much about how to cling through the word of God so we can live lives that are pleasing to him and bear fruit for his glory. I'm excited about doing this study on Ruth because it's got cling all over it. The word is even in the book. And once again, we'll see what it looks like to cling to God and what it looks like when we don't. Ready? Let's jump in. I am in Ruth chapter 1 verse 1, reading from the New American Standard Version. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. So much in this first verse. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed. What days were those? Judges 17.6 sums it up. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And what was right in their eyes was not right in the eyes of God. A key phrase throughout the book of Judges, the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. This was the period after Joshua. Joshua picked up the mantle after Moses and he was a faithful follower of God. Joshua brought the people of Israel into the promised land and led them as a mighty warrior to conquer and settle the land. Before he died, Joshua warned them to keep and do all that was written in the law of Moses and not to associate with other nations and follow their gods. He said, Joshua 23, 8, but you are to cling to the Lord your God as you have done to this day. But after Joshua died, it says this in Judges 2, 10 through 12. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed themselves down to them. Thus they provoked the Lord to anger. This is the backdrop of the book of Ruth. This is the time they lived in. It says there was a famine in the land. Deuteronomy sheds light on that. God had said through Moses in Deuteronomy 11, 13 and 14, it shall come about if you listen obediently to my commandments, which I am commanding you today, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and all your soul, that he will give the rain for your land in its season, the early and late rain, that you may gather in your grain, 
and your new wine and your oil. Then he said in verses 16 through 17, beware that your hearts are not deceived and that you do not turn away and serve other gods and worship them or the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no rain and the ground will not yield its fruit and you will perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. Given the idolatry, the evil that was being done in the sight of the Lord, it's no surprise that there was a famine in the land. So to escape the famine, a man takes his wife and his two sons away from the promised land to the land of Moab. Now it says this is a man of Bethlehem in Judah. Immediately interesting. And we have an entire book of the Bible that is focused on what happens with this family. So these people have to be interesting. But why? Because the Messiah, Christ Jesus, comes from the tribe of Judah. And we are very familiar with Bethlehem where he was born. So we get an immediate foreshadowing that this story and their lives intersect with the Messiah. The other thing we want to note is Moab. When we studied 1st and 2nd Samuel, we focused a lot on Israel's enemy, the Philistines. The Moabites have been enemies of Israel as well. Some of you may remember Balak, king of Moab, who tried to curse the people of Israel. In this period, in the book of Judges, God gave the people of Israel into the hands of the Moabites. The Moabites defeated Israel and Israel had to serve them for 18 years. When they cried out to God for deliverance, God sent a judge and they defeated the Moabites and had rest until they went back to doing evil. Maybe most interesting is how the Moabites came to be. Back in Genesis, when Lot escaped Sodom and Gomorrah and his wife turned to salt, only he and his two daughters were left there. The daughters figured there would be no one else left on earth for them to be with. So they got their father drunk. Each of them lay down with him and they both got pregnant. The firstborn had a son and named him Moab. This is where the Moabites came from. All this backdrop in verse one. Continuing verse two, the name of the man was Elimelech and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. I have seen disagreement as to whether marriage to the Moabites was expressly forbidden. God had said this in Deuteronomy 7. When the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them before you and you defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them and show no favor to them. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. The Moabites were not among those nations. They are mentioned in Deuteronomy 23.3. No Ammonite or Moabite, both of them descended from Lot, shall enter the assembly of the Lord. None of their descendants, even to the 10th generation, shall ever enter the assembly of the Lord because they did not meet you with food and water on the way when you came out of Egypt. 
and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor, from Pethor of Mesopotamia to curse you. However you look at it, this was not an ideal situation. They're not even living in the land God had promised and led his people to. They've had to find refuge among people the Israelites had cried out to be delivered from. Then they go to Moab to find refuge from the famine and Elimelech dies. Maybe they thought they'd only be there a short while, but 10 years has passed. This was surely not the life they'd envisioned. Continuing verse five, then both Malon and Kilian also died and the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Definitely not the life Naomi had envisioned. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab. For she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. There's a key word in this chapter, return. Naomi is ready to return to the land of Judah. She tells her daughters-in-law to return to their mother's house. They had come together for a season, but now Naomi says it's time for us to return to our former lives. Naomi clearly has a loving relationship with her daughters-in-law. We see that they have dealt kindly with her. She prays a blessing upon them and kisses them. Naomi is returning because she's heard that the famine is over. God has visited his people and given them food. She doesn't appear to be returning out of a desire to be near to God. It's not like David where he was upset because Saul was forcing him to flee the land. David said to Saul in 1 Samuel 26, if it's men who have stirred you up against me, Cursed are they before the Lord, for they have driven me out today so that I would have no attachment with the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go, serve other gods. He said, do not let my blood fall to the ground away from the presence of the Lord. David wanted to dwell in the land where the presence of God was. Naomi is like, well, there's food there, so I'll return home. As we'll see, she believes God has dealt bitterly with her. So her relationship with God, clinging to God, that's not in the forefront of her mind. Continuing verse 10, and they said to her, no, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, return my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you. For the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. So Orpah and Ruth, the daughters-in-law, they've assumed that they're going with Naomi. It's not even a thing. They're going. Naomi sets off for Judah and they're right with her on the journey. But Naomi puts a halt to it. Verse 8, return to your mother's house. They say, no, we will surely return with you. Naomi says it a second time, verse 11, return my daughters. And a third time, verse 12, return my daughters. I think Naomi really thinks this is what's best for them. I think she's speaking out of her love for them, but it's clouded by her own lack of clinging to God. 
Look what she says in verse 11. Why should you go with me? And she proceeds to tell them that she wouldn't be able to provide a husband for them. Why should they go with her? How about because they can leave a land where people worship false gods and dwell in the presence of the true God. But that's not in Naomi's mind. She's focused and concerned with earthly relationships, them finding a husband, rather than being concerned for their souls. And we see the heart that this is coming from. Verse 13, it is harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. We can understand why Naomi feels this way. She had to leave her home country because there was no food. She lost her husband and children in a foreign land. She surely feels alone. But what is significant here? She's lamenting about God and talking about God, but we don't see her talking to God. This is why David's Psalms are so powerful. David had these same thoughts, but what did he do with them? He sent them straight up to God. Psalm 13, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. David is clearly like, okay, God, what's up? I'm not hearing from you. I'm feeling defeated. Sorrow in my heart all day. But in all of this, he's talking to God. He puts himself in the presence of God, clinging in his lament. He encourages himself when he does that. It ends with, my heart shall rejoice. I will sing to the Lord. We see the same with Hannah in 1 Samuel 1. She's heartbroken because she cannot have children and her husband's other wife won't let her forget it. She takes her heartbreak to God and strengthens herself in the process. Naomi isn't doing this. And as a result, her actions and her words are flowing from this place of bitterness. When we are clinging to God or not, it affects other people. It affects our witness. It affects our evangelism. It affects whether we are earthly minded or heavenly minded. Orpah and Ruth are Gentiles who are headed to where the true God dwells among his people. Naomi has told them three times emphatically, no, return. Continuing verse 14. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Then she said, behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. So she's persuaded Orpah to go back. And look, she says she's gone back to her people and her gods. She understands the spiritual implications here, but it didn't move her. She now says a fourth time to Ruth, return. But what is Ruth doing? It says Ruth clung to her. Ruth is like, I don't care what you say or how many times you say it. I'm not going anywhere. I am clinging. And she has a powerful response to Naomi's plea for her to go back. Continuing verse 16. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Thus may the Lord do to me and worse, if anything but death parts you 
And me, when she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. Ruth the Moabitess is thinking more about God and where she needs to be spiritually than Naomi. She's like, stop with the foolishness. Return, return. I'm following you. Where you go, I go. Where you lodge, I lodge. I'm adopting your people as my own. Why? Because it's not really about you, Naomi. I'm following the true God. You can't stop me from clinging to God. And you see verse 18, no more return from Naomi's mouth. She says nothing more about it. Continuing verse 19, so they both went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. So Naomi returned and with her, Ruth, the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. The name Naomi means pleasant. She changed her own name to Mara, which means bitter. And we see the bitterness. She insisted her daughters-in-law return, saying the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. Even when Ruth said, I want your people to be my people. I want your God to be my God. Naomi didn't say, that is amazing. Praise the Lord. She just kept moving. Didn't say a word. Now her initial greeting upon her return is, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. And she proceeds to tell them how God has dealt with her. Very bitterly. I went out full. The Lord brought me back empty. He's witnessed against me and afflicted me. Again, these are very real feelings. Naomi has suffered much loss and heartbreak, but she has decided to wrap bitterness around her like a cloak. She's going to make herself at home in it. She has nothing good to say about the Lord. No praise on her lips. No thanks for her daughter-in-law sticking with her. Naomi is not clinging. She doesn't even see that God is actually at work. Look at these last words in the chapter. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Naomi doesn't realize it's not just that God has provided food in the land. He has them in mind. The timing of their return is in his hands. It's harvest time and he has much in store for them, as we will see in the next chapter. I mentioned Hannah earlier, and I want to look at 1 Samuel 1 as we close. Twice it says, the Lord had closed her womb. It also says her rival would provoke her bitterly to irritate her. When they all went up to the house of the Lord, Hannah wept and could not eat. Her husband said, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than 10 sons? Hannah could have gone off on her husband like, are you serious? Why do you think I'm weeping? She could have gone off on Penina or anyone who would listen. She could have told everybody that she was bitter because God had closed her womb and put her in a house where she had to suffer daily. But she simply got up, went to the temple and prayed, weeping before the Lord, acknowledging her affliction, asking him to remember her, to give her a son. She poured out her heart. When she returned to her husband, now she was able to eat and her heart was no longer sad. Nothing had changed as of yet, but that's the fruit of clinging to God. Your peace returns, even your joy. We don't have to make our home in bitterness. We cling to God in the affliction, 
in the hardship, through the tears and the feelings of emptiness, we trust and believe that he is working in all of that, that he is with us. As we cling in the hardship and affliction, we develop a greater intimacy with God. Don't just talk about him, talk to him. Pour out your heart. Let his presence overwhelm you and transform you. And when God puts a roof in your life to walk alongside you, let the sweetness of his presence saturate her too. Cling for you and for those around you.